In lots of sci-fi worlds, a new chemical element is made up that's magically super powerful. As much as I like this idea, it doesn't really make any sense, even with a high school level understanding of chemistry. No shade if you took high school chem and don't know this, that's why I'm here. It's totally valid if that kind of stuff flies over your head, I'm like that but for English and literature stuff. Anyway, let's start by defining elements. The periodic table is set up the way it is for a few reasons, all of which I'll talk about in the video, but let's start with protons so we can answer the first question in the video's title. Elements are numbered from 1 to 118, which tells you exactly how many protons it has. Chlorine is 17, meaning it has 17 protons. Uranium is 92, meaning it has 92 protons. The bigger the number, the bigger the atom. So if you look at the periodic table, you might notice that there's an element for each number up to 118. Who says 118 is the biggest? What if the super cool magic unbreakable element has 119 protons? First, we have to talk about neutrons. These are a part of the mass number under the name of the atom. The mass number is just the sum of protons and neutrons, both of which weigh one unit. Hydrogen's mass number is 1.008, which is usually rounded down to one. We do a lot of rounding in chemistry. Hydrogen's got one proton and it usually doesn't have a neutron with it, so its mass number is just one. A hydrogen with one neutron has a mass number of two, and a hydrogen with two neutrons has a mass number of three. Different atoms with the same number of protons but a different amount of neutrons are called isotopes. So any atom with just one proton is hydrogen, but varying neutron numbers means you've got different isotopes. These isotopes of hydrogen with neutrons in them are super super rare, which is why hydrogen's official mass number is closer to 1 than 2 or 3. Carbon's mass number is 12.011, which we usually round to 12 because carbon's most common form is with 6 neutrons. Carbon-13 is still stable though, and then I'm sure you've also heard of carbon-14 from radiocarbon dating, which is an unstable but naturally occurring isotope. Let's talk about stability. Carbon-14 has a half-life of about 6,000 years, meaning if I have 2 kilograms of carbon-14 today, it'll have degraded it to 1 kilogram 6,000 years from now. 6,000 years from then, it'll be half a kilogram. That'll keep happening till it's all degraded to nitrogen-14 through beta decay. I'll talk about decay types some other day, honestly I gotta do more research on it myself before then. Anyway, an unstable atom decays in some amount of time. As they get bigger, they need more neutrons to keep stable, so one neutron per proton usually only works as a general rule for smaller atoms. There's a point though that really big elements have no stable isotopes. Lead is number 82, but once you get past that, every element has some level of radioactivity. This is a real problem for a dream of a useful super element, unless we're okay with it being radioactive. Well, it gets worse. With an atomic number of 83, Bismuth is technically radioactive, but its half-life is longer than the age of the universe, so it's probably fine. It's really not dangerous at all to handle or have on you. Side note, if you're wondering how the heck we know about these super long half-lives, no one's sitting next to carbon-14 for a few thousand years to see when it decays to half its original weight. There's just some semi-complicated math you have to do to figure out with ratios and stuff like that. I'll probably research more about that with the decay stuff. Anyway, do we have hope that an undiscovered element could just be a little radioactive and still be stable enough to use? No. At atomic number 100, fermium's most stable isotope has a half-life of just over 100 days. It doesn't get better as you get higher. Rutherfordium is number 104, and that one's got a 48 minute half-life at best. Number 109's best shot is 67 seconds, and number 118 has a half-life of 0.7 milliseconds. Only five atoms of it have ever been made, and there's no point of it existing. Same with the 17 elements before it, at least. The only reason they made it was to finish period 7, which is the last row of elements. Wait, why are they organized in rows and columns? Okay, before we get into that, let me just finish up the first question in the title of the video. We've basically discovered all the elements that could possibly be of any use, so there's no possibility of finding a new element with new properties. We could maybe discover new compounds of old elements, but that's a topic for another day. To figure out the point of rows and columns, we have to learn about electrons. 
While a lot of this was covered in the advanced chem I took in high school, I'm mostly thanking the review we did at the start of the organic chem class I'm taking this semester for what I remember about this topic. Yes, I should remember it from the gen chem class I took last year, but my brain wasn't fully formed at the time and I barely remember anything. Not that my brain's fully formed now, but it's a little better. Anyway, protons, which we talked about before, have a positive charge. An atom has a neutral charge though, because it has an equal number of electrons to balance it out. This works because electrons have an equal negative charge, despite having a negligible mass compared to protons and neutrons. No, I don't know how that works. An atom with an unequal amount of protons to electrons is called an ion, and if it's less electrons, it's a positive ion, while if it's more electrons, it's a negative ion. What do electrons have to do with the periodic table, though? Hydrogen and helium are on the first row of the periodic table, aka period 1. This is where it starts to get kind of complicated, so I'll do a bit of simplification, partly because I don't even know the unsimplified version. Electrons group in what we call shells, but they're really more like layers. The first or innermost layer can only hold two electrons, which is why period 1 just has elements 1 and 2. The next two shells can hold 8 electrons, the next two after that can hold 18, and the last two can hold 32. However, and this is very important, the outermost shell, which we call the valence shell, can only hold 8. The valence shell is the most important one, and it decides a lot about the properties of the element. Let's focus on the first three periods for a bit, so the only columns AK groups we have to worry about are 1, 2, and 13 through 18, which makes a total of 8. Groups 1 and 2 have 1 and 2 valence electrons respectively, 13 has 3, 14 has 4, and so on until you get to group 18, which has a full valence shell of 8. To oversimplify, atoms like having a full valence shell, so they bond with others to get the electrons they want. That's why group 18 is called the noble gases, they don't really associate with all the losers who don't have complete shells. Or anyone else. Usually. To explain after period 3, I'll have to get even more in-depth about electrons. You might think they just fill up from the bottom and you just move up a shell when they get one under it as full, but that would be too easy. The thing on the left is the pattern they fill up in, which is at least easy to remember, or at least it's easy to remember how to write it down. But to know what you're looking at, you have to know about orbitals, which is the shape electrons make when they orbit around the atom. It's defined as being a 90-something percent chance that you'll find an electron in the spots you looked. No, I don't know how that works either. The letters S, P, D, and F describe the shapes of the orbitals. Orbitals. <laughs> the letters S, P, D, and F describe the shapes of the orbitals, and I won't totally get into them again, because I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. And so far through three years of college, I haven't had to know about them at all. The numbers before them signify which shell we're talking about. What you should know is that D and F orbitals take more energy to fill. And so, even though generally lower shell numbers fill up first, that's why 4s is filled with 4,3d. So, if we look back at the periodic table, you'll notice there's nothing in groups 3 to 12 till period 4, and that's why this is called the D block. Most of them still have two or occasionally one valence electron, because even though the number of electrons is going up, they're going into the shell under the valence shell. The F block, which is the lanthanoids and actinoids that are kind of shoved off into the bottom, are basically the same thing but for the bigger F orbitals rather than D orbitals. But yeah, that was a little explanation of the periodic table and some other stuff I thought was interesting. Most of my videos aren't like this, but hey, if you're into speculative evolution, Pokemon, or world building, check out my other videos. Support me on Patreon, link in the description, and thanks to Captain Kobop and Art of Dying. I hope to see you in some of my other videos, but either way, thanks for watching.